When we think of Bam Bam Bigelow, we think of the unreal agility the guy had for someone his size. Bigelow was able to work with anyone and adapt to their style to make matches work. Perfect example being how he carried an American football player through the main event of WrestleMania. Bigelow was another well respected worker with many superstars claiming that Bam Bam was a big influence on their careers. Bam Bam's speed for someone his size was an unseen sight back in the 80s and even in the early 90s. Unfortunately though, Bam Bam had problems with the click in the WWF which was back then the kiss of death for many in the company. This didn't stop Bam Bam from working in other major promotions in America. An instantly recognisable star by the flame tattoos on his head and also on his ring gear, Bigelow is another big name who didn't have a run with the WWF Championship, but he really should have. Bam Bam was trained at Larry Sharp's world famous Monster Factory in New Jersey. Bigelow was the first famous pupil out of the school and Sharp, along with nature boy Buddy Rogers, went on to train the likes of Raven, D'Lo Brown, Chris Candido, The Big Show and Sheamus, just to name a small few. Bam Bam's success brought a lot of attention to the school. Like many others who have been covered in this video series, Bigelow started his career in Memphis with Jerry Jarrett and Jerry Lawler's Continental Wrestling Association. Bigelow debuted as a monster heel, gaining the moniker The Beast from the East. This moniker would stick with Bigelow throughout his entire career. Bigelow worked in the CWA for a year in 1986 and also worked in world class championship wrestling towards the end of the year under a different gimmick. He worked as a Russian heel with the name Crusher Yukov. Bigelow's first WWE run was short but interesting. He was brought in as a heel but quickly turned babyface when the battle for Bam Bam took place. Every heel manager in the WWF wanted to represent Bam Bam Bigelow but he would end up choosing Oliver Humperdinck and turning babyface, much to the dismay of the heel managers. At the first ever Survivor Series in 1987, Bigelow was a member of Hulk Hogan's team where he had a good showing but eventually got eliminated by Andre the Giant. It appeared that Bam Bam was receiving a monster push right out of the gate and it's something that's often forgotten about when we talk about the WWF's golden era. That said, Bam Bam entered the WrestleMania 4 title tournament and got eliminated via countout. From here, he would lose a string of house show matches to one man gang. His last match in his initial WWF run was on June 25th 1988 when he was pinned by Andre the Giant in Madison Square Garden, then Bigelow disappeared entirely. What went wrong? Bam Bam had injured his knee during his initial WWF run, which Bigelow said put a halt to his WWF push. This also explains why his match at WrestleMania 4 ended the way it did and in such quick fashion. Because of the bad knee, Bigelow wasn't able to work as frequently and he felt that WWF couldn't compensate him well enough while he was on the sidelines, so he decided to find his fortunes elsewhere. Bam Bam showed up in Jim Crockett promotions just three months after leaving the WWF and would be launched straight into a program with NWA heavyweight champion Barry Windham. The desire to work in Japan was too much for Bigelow though and he decided to leave JCP after a short period of time and jump over to New Japan Pro Wrestling. Here, Bam Bam would team up with Big Van Vader, creating a monster tag team and really got over in Japan. Not only did Bigelow capture the IWGP tag titles with Vader, but he also polished up on his ring skills a ton while in Japan. He would briefly bring his skills back to Jim Crockett Promotions, which was now renamed WCW after Ted Turner purchased the company, before making his return to Vince McMahon and the WWF. On the November 28, 1992 episode of WWF Superstars, Bigelow made his WWF in-ring return when he defeated enhancement guy Jerry Fox in his first appearance with the company since 1988. He made his pay-per-view return at the 1993 Royal Rumble, scoring a win over the Big Boss Man, which was also the Boss Man's last pay-per-view match during his initial WWF stint. For more info on the Boss Man, check out my previous video. Bigelow would march onto the 1993 King of the Ring and have a great showing at the event. Bam Bam found himself in the finals with Bret Hart and the two had an incredible match and probably my favourite match of Bam Bam's career. The Hitman and the Beast from the East put on a great story in the ring, only heightened by the fact that Bret Hart had a barn burner also in the semi-finals against Mr Perfect. 
While Bam Bam fell short of becoming King of the Ring, he did show he was very capable of working a main event with the most capable performers in the business. Bam Bam would then find love when he was paired with Luna Vachon and began working simultaneous angles with Tatanka and Doink. It was Bigelow's work against Doink that is mostly remembered though. After meeting at the Survivor Series 1993 in a traditional Survivor Series match, the pair would meet again in a tag match at WrestleMania 10 in 1994. Luna and Bam Bam defeated Doink and Dink at WrestleMania 10 in Madison Square Garden. Bigelow would then join the Million Dollar Corporation later in 1994, becoming one of the bigger stars in DiBiase's faction. He teamed with Tatanka in a tournament to crown new WWF Tag Team Champions. Bigelow and Tatanka were defeated though by Bob Holly and the 123 Kid in the tournament finals at the 1995 Royal Rumble. This though gained a huge laugh from pro footballer Lawrence Taylor who was sitting at ringside. After Bam Bam pushed the former New York Giants linebacker, a match was booked between the two at WrestleMania 11. Bam Bam Bigelow vs Lawrence Taylor would main event WrestleMania, putting the WWF Championship match between Shawn Michaels and Diesel in the semi main event spot. The fact that Bigelow was placed higher than Sean and Diesel on the WrestleMania 11 card, and the fact that Bam Bam also stood up for click bully victim Chris Candido, put Bigelow in a tough spot in the WWF. What should have been a springboard match for Bam Bam would turn out to be his peak in the WWF. Bam Bam carried Taylor through a match that exceeded most expectations. Most of the match was Bam Bam working submissions and making LT look good by bouncing around at the minimal offence Taylor was able to pull off. It certainly won't be remembered as a great wrestling match, but the pair got through it. Taylor won, but Bam Bam couldn't have been asked to do any more in this role. You have to remember that Vince McMahon knew this match would garner mainstream attention and he had to have put an incredible amount of trust in Bam Bam to carry the match and make sure it went off without a hitch. Bam Bam done exactly what was asked of him. It should also be noted that Kevin Nash has said in subsequent shoot interviews that the Click had no problem with Bam Bam and they actually liked him, but this is the total opposite of what Bam Bam has said. Bigelow has openly said that the Click went out of their way to make people's lives a living hell. On the Click, Bam Bam said, Everything is strength in numbers and the click had the numbers. You know, you had Diesel, you had Michaels and Helmsley, Scott Hall, this group of guys that were actually telling Vince McMahon what to do. A terrible, terrible time. It hurt a lot of people. To them, it became a joke because they had control. So it was like, okay, let's fuck with this guy now. Okay, well, we got him out. Now let's go to this guy and let's ruin his life and get him fired. Ok, now let's get this guy. Bigelow wouldn't last the remainder of the year in the WWF. He turned babyface shortly after the LT main event at WrestleMania 11 after leaving the Million Dollar Corporation. He tagged with Diesel at the 1995 King of the Ring to defeat Tatanga and Psycho Sid. Bigelow continued to feud with the Million Dollar Corporation throughout the summer of 1995 and he lost his final WWF match against newcomer Goldust at the 1995 Survivor Series. Bam Bam felt that the click was keeping him held down during his final babyface run and he decided that he had enough of the antics. Bam Bam would show up in the thriving ECW promotion to begin a feud with Taz. Before continuing his ECW run, Bigelow would travel to Japan to compete in a legitimate MMA match against Kimo Leopoldo. Kimo was no stranger to legitimate fights. The American had already competed in the UFC and in K1, and after the Bigelow match he would go on to compete in Pride and more UFC events. Bigelow had no real MMA training and it showed during the fight. Bigelow was mounted within the first 10 seconds of the fight and subsequently lost to a rear naked choke in the first round. Bam Bam would later say that the fight was a work, but it sure doesn't look like it was. Bam Bam also claimed that he was paid $100,000 for the fight. Bam Bam would return to ECW in 1997 where he was a member of the Triple Threat faction along with Chris Candido and leader Shane Douglas. The Triple Threat was Shane Douglas's answer to the Four Horsemen in WCW as Shane had a dislike for Ric Flair. 
Despite being a dominating team, there was some infighting that led to a match being booked between Bigelow and Douglas and in October of 1997, Bigelow defeated the franchise and captured his first heavyweight championship in North America. Bigelow's title reign would be short lived though as he dropped the belt back to Shane shortly thereafter and eventually rejoined the group. At Living Dangerously 1998, Bigelow defeated Taz to capture the ECW Television Championship, surviving a fall through the ring in the process. This clip of Bam Bam and Taz going through the ring was frequently used in ECW video packages, and with good reason. It was a great visual. When Bigelow was ready to leave ECW for a big payday with Ted Turner's WCW, the triple threat was disbanded and each member went their separate ways. On the November 16th, 1998 episode of Monday Nitro, Bigelow returned to World Championship Wrestling. The company was just beginning its hardcore division and Bam Bam would be a mainstay in the category. Before this though, he had the pleasure of working with Bill Goldberg at Super Brawl 9. He obviously lost. Bigelow would then join Canyon and DDP in forming the Jersey Triad. The Triad won the WCW tag titles and they were allowed to defend the belts under the Freebird rule. The Triad had an excellent series of matches against combinations of Raven, Perry Saturn and Chris Benoit and it's definitely recommended that you go back and watch some of these matches. In particular, the 20 minute match featuring DDP and Canyon vs Benoit and Saturn at the Great American Bash 1999 is definitely worth a watch. The group would break up when DDP turned babyface and feuded with Bigelow and Canyon. It's a shame too as the Jersey Triad was actually a quite entertaining group within a floundering WCW at the time. It was also during this time that Bam Bam Bigelow and his wife got divorced. She would later sue him for non-payment of child support. In the same year, on July 4th, 2000, Bigelow received second degree burns on 40% of his body when rescuing three children from a burning house near his home in New Jersey. Bigelow spent 10 days recovering in hospital. Bam Bam would then return to WCW's hardcore division and eventually feuded with Sean Stasiak. He stayed with WCW right up until the company was purchased by the WWE, even being featured in the last ever broadcast of WCW Nitro. His Time Warner contract didn't expire until 2002, so he decided to stay at home and collect the money instead of joining the WCW invasion within the WWF. He worked his final match in 2006 at an independent show. The year before his last match, Bigelow was in a serious motorcycle accident in October of 2005. His girlfriend Janice was also involved as she was a passenger on the motorcycle and her injuries were much more severe than Bigelow's. She eventually made a complete recovery though. On January 19th, 2007, Janice found Bam Bam Bigelow dead inside his home in Hudson, Florida. Bam Bam died from a drug overdose of cocaine and an unnamed anti-anxiety drug, most likely a benzo. He had a history of drug and alcohol use that was mentioned after his death by many that knew him during his life. It's also been reported that Bam Bam Bigelow was in serious debt around the time he died. He had a few failed investments in later life, including a restaurant which didn't generate the profits Bam Bam hoped it would. Add to this the thousands he already owed in unpaid child support and you can see why Bigelow would move home often to avoid debt collectors. Bam Bam was penniless when he died and he didn't accept any further independent bookings to help with his finance. Perhaps this was due to his body breaking down or maybe he just lost his passion for professional wrestling. Bam Bam was heavily rumoured to be inducted into the 2019 Hall of Fame. WrestleMania 35 was held in New Jersey and it seemed that Bam Bam Bigelow was a lock-in. The induction didn't happen but we will hopefully see Bam Bam get his induction soon. In all honesty, it's kind of a travesty that Bam Bam Bigelow hasn't been inducted already into the Hall of Fame.